Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Uh, that movie, it's a, it's a cool movie. Now, I wanted to do a little, uh, a quick review of your, what I call the Stallone-Blakely trilogy, okay? And yeah. the first movie, or, yeah, the first movie you play in, in Lords of Flatbush, you're his friend's girlfriend, and the second movie, Capone, you're his boss's girlfriend, and then now you're married to him and over the top, but... You, uh, you're, you're, there's no scenes together, so it was kind of interesting. No. <laughs> well, we're all, we have phone scenes together. Right. I mean, right. my my scenes, as I recall, I didn't have many. We were with Robert Loggia. Once yeah. again, I do a thing. Now, again, you know, it, it took me a long time to get that. This is just it's entertainment, folks. You know, it's showbiz. But I cut my hair off and browned it, and I kind of made my teeth look weird. I did a whole thing trying to look because I was dying. I made my dying, skin all. Yeah. Yeah, I had my skin made all look white. I couldn't have looked worse, right? But it wasn't that kind of movie that anybody cared. You know, I could have looked a little better. Didn't have to look that bad. <laughs> you know, my training no, was in New York. You look and very I... pretty for it. For oh, a no, I look horrible. Well, Thank you. There's only one thing I've ever done that I look worse, which is when I – it was a TV movie that um, that uh, Diane Keaton directed from a book, and it was called Wildflower. I think the book was called Alice, a wonderful book. But um, – but I play a mountain woman, and I think that was in the early 90s, but with, in, like in a gunny sack, and they pockmarked my skin, and, and I think they may have taken out teeth. I always wanted, always wanted those roles, you know. <laughs> Whenever I see Charlene Theron doing those, I say, oh, yeah, that's the kind of role I wanted to do, too. <laughs> All right, yeah. Um, now, Over the Top, this movie has, has a huge cult following, okay, and, 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 you know, Stallone, Sylvester Stallone, at this point, it was, it's interesting because when you worked with him, on Lords and on Capone, he was, you know, he wasn't big at all. He was he was a very small actor. He wasn't uh, famous. And now you're working with him, and he's like one of the most famous guys in the world, M- maybe the most in 1986 when you did. God, you're right, right. So what was there? I mean, how was that working with with Sly again? But this time he's huge. Is it was there any difference, or was it just? Well, you know, it's time? interesting. I forget, but you, I, I I forget until you say it. But you're absolutely right. At that point, he was uh, he was. Probably at the very top, you know. He was, well, yeah, he was, yeah. And um, he was the same, you know. I mean, honestly, this sounds weird, but um, whereas I'm sort of the same in a different way, yeah. even when I had fame or didn't as a model or whatever, I never really changed because the way I was brought up in a certain way. I think Stallone really didn't change that much either in that he had incredible confidence. When I met him on uh, Lords of Flatbush, he was dirt poor. He had no money, but he had confidence in himself. He, he carried himself in a certain way, and he just always knew that he was, you know, uh, that he was going to be a star. And um, and I think that not that he was ever like a, I, I never when I've seen him during that show and other times I've never seen him be any sort of conceited star. I don't mean that. I just mean that he had he had a certain confidence that very few mm-hmm. people would have had starting off. And so I didn't see a huge difference. He was very down to earth still, and uh, I didn't really see a difference in him. Yeah, that's, have you heard uh, otherwise ever? I never did. <laughs> yeah, well, no, yeah, I didn't even mean you know as far as it. it just it's interesting, you know, because I mean it, he, he just got right after uh, Capone was Rocky. I mean that was '76, and he wrote that script, one of the best scripts ever, Rocky. So he uh, he really is amazing. Yeah, so over the top, it's got a huge uh, huge following, and. And even really? though you're not in it much, it you wasn't are the very best. Important. You're very important. Well, you know, I don't know that it was one of his one of the better. I think that there were certain problems with that that show again, and one of the problems, honestly, was the director who Stallone didn't really get along with. Oh wow! Uh, Menahem Golan, who was a producer. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he even ever directed anything else again. Wow. But he directed that, and I know that I think that both Stallone and Robert Loggia were not really getting along with him. I think he was a yeller. You know, he was kind of uh-huh. a screamer on the set. Um, so he I don't was like know a what producer. Happened. He acted like a producer, kind of. A well, producer. yes, he was a producer that wanted to direct, and I'm surprised that Stallone let him. But maybe he just wanted to do it. He was sort of a character. I I kind of enjoyed him because he was a he was loud, but he he didn't scare me or anything. Like yeah. some some people can be a little scary. I don't think that he had that going. But Golan, uh, is he but he Globus directed him. He, he produced a million things. Oh, him and he was Glo- a, Globus or Golan Globus, those guys. Um, are, yes, Golan Globus. Yes, almost everything That's what it was. I could think of in the '80s as far as action. I mean, my gosh, those guys were just did everything. Well, that must have been it. I mean, that must have been how he how he became uh, how he. I, I just don't know if he ever directed anything else. I don't know if he had directed before or after. 
I do remember that <laughs> that during the scenes that I had on the phone wow. with both Stallone and um, Robert Loggia, mm-hmm. I had arrived like the night before from London. I'd been shooting the Teddy Kennedy Jr. story um, with Delbert Mann was the director. Oh, yeah. Delbert Mann, who did Marty, and uh, was he was president of the Directors Guild a few times. Wonderful director. I worked with three times. Anyway, I just arrived, and um, they had shot the scenes that I now would be on the phone with. So they, I mean, if I was on the phone with Stallone, they'd already shot him on the, on the phone. Oh, I'm sorry. Robert Loggia came. Robert Loggia was in person with me. It was just the phone. It was the phone scenes I had with Stallone. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. he was he was driving across country with the kid with my our our son. Yeah. And um, I just remember that Menahem would yell. Um, there was a script girl who was saying Stallone's lines, and just when I would start to answer. He would yell stuff, whatever it would be. Uh, hold the phone away. Uh, put your, you know, put your hand over here. Uh, put your hair here. Right during the scenes, I'd have to kind of stop, and we, you know, I looked around like this is very highly unusual, you know, that having someone yell during the scenes, <laughs> this sort of nonstop. It's like, a, it's like a silent film or something. Yeah, it was. It was very strange. <laughs> now you've played. Uh, you, you mentioned like in Concord, you played the the, the girlfriend of kind of bad guys or whatever, but boy, probably the epitome of that would be the bunker, right? You play... Oh, you're so funny. I mean, yes, you're absolutely right, the epitome of it. Hitler, any, I guess you're right. Can you get any more, uh, what? Any Evil? Of, bad? Any badder? <laughs> so, now, you play Ava, Ava Braun, okay? Yes. Now, just tell me a little bit about playing this character and how you studied for that, I mean, because this is a real historic character, and she's the mistress of like the worst guy in history, we could say probably. Uh, yes. So what? What was well, that like? Well, I think some of them are, are giving us a run for his money now. Um, he he was what was it like? Well, well, honestly, it was it was quite interesting because when I was um, studying to do it, I was so excited. Anthony Hopkins playing Hitler, and I thought, and I started to read about it. And I'd been a kid in Germany uh, in the fifties, and my in the army we had some German friends because they. they they quote rehabilitated a lot of the Nazi soldiers, and it's fascinating for me to look back and see what my parents and my father, in particular, after being in the war, how they were able, were able to adjust. If you're in the army, you do what the army tells you to do, you know. And and they, we actually they actually were friends with some of these people, and I only knew them as our you know as our friends. But looking, trying to read about a Nazi Germany in detail, and I got all kinds of books. There's so many books on it. Oh my God, I would just start to weep. I would literally start weeping, and I would tell my husband, oh, my God, I can't read this, I can't do it. Oh, my Lord. So finally, what I decided to do, literally, was you do read a lot that that not not all the German people really knew everything that was going on. They just couldn't have, you know. And um, so I played it that she, I mean, she was sort of a, I wouldn't say so much as a peasant, but um, she de- she definitely was lower middle class, the way she was brought up. Um, and and so I think that for her, I looked at Hitler as a as, like like Ava as a groupie to Hitler, oh, like yeah. a woman of my age would have been to 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 marry a beetle, do you know? Yeah. To, to marry one of the beetles, <laughs> and so and so I thought this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to look at this as I get to marry um, Anthony Hopkins. I can see that, <laughs> and I really decided to kind of take myself. Usually I use the story. Completely, but this story was beyond my handling. So I thought I'm going to do this, and I'm just going to see. Whenever it gets difficult, I'm just going to look at Anthony Hopkins and go, "Oh wow, I get I get to be Anthony Hopkins' girlfriend, and we're going to get to be married," you know. But the very first day that I arrived at the hotel, I was signing in, and I looked across the lobby, and I looked at this man from the back, and he was walking like Hitler. I swear to God, I don't know if. Anthony Hopkins was, had already been studying film and was was using this. Uh-huh. It was so strange. Anyway, um, but it was I actually had a good time because the bunker where that was it was it was based on the last days of Hitler and the Nazis and the, the Nazis who were there with him. Many who were trying to kill him, you know, yeah. at that point they were trying to get rid of him because uh, he was a little crazy, gone around the bend, and and they and we shot this in Paris. What could be better? Oh my God, it was a dream job. Back in those days, they gave you you know a lot of per diem. It was when TV was different, and it was I think it was a Hallmark or one of the you know one of the top shows. Yeah. So we had a nice per diem, and I was determined to spend every penny eating all around Paris. 
and uh, I didn't have to work that much. And in the bunker, I found that, I think we were there six weeks, and a lot of the actors kind of started to get a little depressed, a little depressing. But my character wasn't depressed, you know? I was going to get to be Mrs. Hitler. I didn't care if we died. I was happy to die a martyr, being being finally Mrs. Hitler, you know, something I... Because he didn't marry her, don't forget. And all that time they were together, I was his mistress. He wasn't married, but he didn't marry me. It was a strange relationship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really was. I got to see that one again. That's a that's a really... Uh, yeah, I got to see that. Um, so... Now let me talk about some of the like the first thing it says here that you did was called Savages. Yes, that was my first film. You're right. Your first film. Now, now so you before in this you were a model and then you you got into acting. So that that's uh, well I don't know what was the transition. What, did you set out to be an actress and you became a model or did you? You know I I you know it's one of these things you look back and you say oh my god I didn't have any sort of plan or really I just kind of thought I'd be an actress doing theater. And um, it was in the days where I was ready to leave home, and I, I left home, and I couldn't decide between San Francisco, because of the song "If You're Going to San Francisco." Yeah. <laughs> I think the mamas and the papas sang it. It wasn't their, it, they weren't the first people to do it, but I think they yeah. sang it. And then I decided to go to New York, and I fell into modeling. And partly, part part of my going to New York was around somebody who had take, taken pictures of me, and I'd actually end up going to Germany again, nothing to do with growing up there, but it had been a German uh, soldier who had gone back to Germany and they sent for me to go to Germany for some sort of contest and the woman there had been a model with Fords huh. and she took me around uh, Germany to different places and she, um, so she, somehow I got the idea that I could easily be a model. Everybody was saying, stay here and be a model. But my my parents, I had to go back. My parents were stationed in El Paso. And at the time I went to Germany, I think they were in Mexico on a trip. I had a passport, and it was sudden, and I just went. And I was too young, and my father was going to send the MPs after me. <laughs> I had some threatening uh-huh. phone call or something. So I came home, but they had said I should model. So uh, I had the name of Eileen Ford. Honestly, I didn't even know who Eileen Ford was. Uh-huh. And I ended up going to New York from some contest out of El Paso, and the and the person that it was part of the contest was you got to meet, you know, a top quote top modeling agency. But the guy there, he he handled models that were not at all top models. And he said to me the day I walked in, he was very honest. He said, "Listen, I'd be thrilled to handle you, but you're going to go with Eileen eventually anyway. So you might as well." And I said, "Oh, Eileen Ford, I have her name right here from this woman who had been a model with her in Germany, who ran the." Uh, the the build on some tog their big paper who had who had done this whole story of me with modeling pictures right yeah but it had nothing to do with that contest it was all very complicated but I went there and I immediately started I started with I went over to meet Eileen and they set me up on a commercial which I got that day for Clairol oh. and so my modeling career just took off and I also because I, I was studying acting I could do a lot of you know I I could actually do commercials where a lot of models couldn't in those days. They were okay on print, but they weren't comfortable in front of a camera or talking on film, you know. So so I really built up a career as a model at the same time, st- studying acting and doing commercials. So that's kind of how it started. Well, I mean, you know, it's just amazing. Sometimes you think of models and, and, and they don't, you know, become actresses or they try or whatever, but it's just, it's, it's, you have such a great career. I mean, great model and you're acting. You're just such a great actress. You're one of my favorite actresses, and you really transform into these roles. What can I say? Oh, um, you're so sweet. You're just, such uh, sweet of you. Just, and, and you look. And you know, I, I'm talking about this stuff like all these movies. You, you, you've been in a lot of uh, stuff. You were in uh, Two and a Half Men. Love doing Two and a Half Men. I love yeah. comedy. I mean, one of my favorite shows. Before I could talk about Two and a Half Men, that I got because I got Two and a Half Men because of a show I'd done called Side Order of Life, and it wasn't on long. I think it was, I can't remember if it was Lifetime or USA uh, oh, yeah. channel. It was one or the other, but, you know, you guys, I know you, you can look everything up. <laughs> but um, but it was, it was, I had a terrific role to play, a really, really funny role. And the casting people who had cast me on that, who had brought me up on that, and that show that I, that I got, they had remembered me, um, Nikki Valko, Ken Miller, Peter, I think it was Peter Pop, Popkus, Pappas. Um, mm-hmm. And so they brought me in on, Two and a Half Men, and it was just perfect that they didn't bring many people in, and and Chuck Lorre couldn't have been nicer. Chuck Lorre and Lee Aronson, Aronson, they laughed their heads off, and it was well written, and I just loved doing it. I had a great time. 
now on Two and a Half Men, so you, you are in a couple episodes. Yes, I did two. In fact, one of them, John Cryer, I think John Cryer directed the first one. Oh, wow. The first one is my favorite because I have a better, you know, you get to know the character. I mean, it was I was very lucky because th- these were big roles. Um, even if I'd just done one of them, you rarely get a guest, rarely ever get a guest role that's that juicy. So I love that they were giving me roles or giving anyone a role like that. Well, tell me about, you know, tell me about this role. Tell me about your character and everything, and then I'm, I'm going to... I play a woman who who writes self-help books, and I meet Charlie. Something is going on in his life. I can't remember where he's having problems with intimacy. And he's at a bookstore with, with uh, John Cryer, and um, gosh, I'm having trouble remembering the the, um, the son's name. Angus, I know, plays him. Jake. Angus, Jake is the yeah. character. Yeah, Jake is the character's name. So so Jake and Alan Harper, his brother and, and, and nephew, are looking at a book, so he meets me at the bookstore. And... Uh, and he's attracted to me, and we go out. And right away, there's age difference. And and it comes up. I remember there's something funny that comes up that he says, uh, he, he, he has no idea that I'm as old as I am. And he says something about uh, some year when I say that I was, um, some, something comes up, oh, I know, we're eating Ethiopian food. That's right. And I say, oh, yes, I loved it when I was in Ethiopia in 19, I don't know what I say, 69 or something. Uh-huh. He says, "Oh God, were you a kid there?" And I said, "Oh no, no, I was a, uh, I was uh, in the Peace Corps, and um, I was already, I don't know, I, I was out of college or whatever, right?" Yeah. And and he and he, and he's, you see him staring, and I say, "Need a pencil?" <laughs> because I know he's doing the math, you know. <laughs> and what he doesn't really realize in the beginning that comes uh, that I thought was so so smart is that is that I'm sort of the nice mother because you know the mother in the show. Um, Taylor um, Taylor Holland plays Holland Taylor. Holland, I'm sorry, Holland Taylor, Holland Taylor plays the, the the mother, and she and she's always a bitch, you know, <laughs> a very unloving mother. So he, he you know, it, it takes him a while to get that I am. Um, it takes you know, the son, to, the other son too. I mean, John Cryer's characters too. They start competing for my affection, is what happens, <laughs> and because they don't realize I'm I'm actually a mother figure. Well, that you know, that's also true because you look great. You look. Uh... Great, and you're you're uh, and, yeah, and and that's perfect. I mean, and and you're on Cougar Town just recently, right? Is this? Yes, I play a real a horrible woman. <laughs> I play Krista Miller's mother, and uh, I hope they have me back, but I don't know if they will because the the, the storyline pretty much is when Courtney Cox ends up telling her it's okay to let her mother go. I mean, I'm just that bad. I'm just horrendous, and you know how sweet they all are on that show, you know. So for Courtney Cox to say it's okay. Just because she's your mother, I'm just horrible, and, and no one believes I'm horrible because I'm sort of two-faced. They cut out some of the scenes that I really liked early on, where you see how sweet I am before you see that I'm two-faced. Now I just seem more like a bitch by what they showed, but um, but it's it's pretty bad. And I but I think the show got picked up right by by a different network. I think. Yeah, I think so. It, it, uh, now I want to let's uh, we could conclude here with something you did. Uh, you played Francis Farmer. And will there really be a morning? So this was uh, how was it playing her, that character? That's a, another real life character. Oh my God! How was it? Well, um, that's actually what was difficult about playing that role. It was a real life character. It's funny. It just came up today at our book club because we were talking about uh, at my book club, and something came up about Frances Farmer. I'd read the book, her autobiography, and I'd been offered it for over a year before I took it. I finally took it because everybody in town wanted to do it. <laughs> you know? I thought, oh, God, I should do it. I've made too many mistakes in turning things down. But it was just the reason I turned it down was that there was not one good thing. It was so depressing. <laughs> Everything bad. One, my God. And, it was, and not only that, because it was a real story, a real woman, um, I found myself, there was one night when we were going back to this, um, uh, these, these sort of apartment we'd rented. I remember we had a long hallway, and my husband and I were, Walking back after a day where I'd been in the in the in the insane asylum and you know she's been raped and I mean just horrible things had gone on and I think I had shock treatment that day fake shock shock just fake shock treatment and a fake ice bath although there was ice real ice involved it was a horrible thing and I could think oh my God the fact that this woman lives through this it was so hard to take that one night walking down to my room I my knees just buckled and I just just laid on the ground and just started sobbing. You know, I'd made it a home fine, and I just, my husband looked at me, and I thought, and this has never happened to me. I'm not some sort of weird person, but, my God, when you're living this life of somebody every single day, and it's different 
than something that's made up. When you know this person lived through these horrendous circumstances and the fact that she didn't really have love from her mother in the right way, but she had this, there was this attachment um, where her mother was a stage mother and wanted wanted her to be a Hollywood star. And Frances was gorgeous. She was a beautiful, beautiful woman. But she was an intellect and wanted to go to New York. And um, and there was always this push and pull between the mother that just kept pulling her back into her life. And then, and I do think she suffered some from some sort of. Uh, uh, I think she had some sort of mental illness. Mm-hmm. I don't know that we would know what it was, but not just that. They were giving her in those days, a lot of the stars were on um, diet pills. Mm-hmm. I forget what they were called, but she was on diet pills and she was probably an alcoholic too. And so you mix that all together and she ended up alienating people and, and seeming and seeming to be a threat. And, not for, and don't forget also she was a woman. She mm-hmm. was a woman who would take on, um, she she would take on, the the police or whoever it was um, take on the studio. She took people on and she would lose it. And you know they put her away. Yeah. Anyway, it was so so sad. Don't want to end on that note, but anyway, well, no, it really I, wasn't well, even. It, but that you played it, and that, you know it's interesting that there was a movie Francis that came out around the same time. So there was two things, the movie and then the TV show. Uh, but I need to see this one because uh, I have to. See yeah, it's it's, it's hard. It's 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 difficult. It's difficult for me. I started to watch it once again. It's difficult to watch. Um, I think she was very high strung, and and it made me sad. It just made, it was it was sad to do, but it was uh, you know we got great reviews. <laughs> so there's some good things about it. Okay, then let's end on uh, let's end on a happy note. Then I'm finding something here. Um, I was going to talk about Rich Man Poor Man book two again. That I was uh, of all the characters to die in Vietnam, I didn't think it was going to be you. I got to tell you, it was very. <laughs> <laughs> the son, yeah. Your son was in Vietnam, and you were against it, of course, because it's like my son is in this war. And uh, but then uh, it was it was interesting though, because in book two, which I really enjoy, although it's nothing like the original, um, Peter Strauss is uh, or Rudy is is in Vietnam doing his thing. All of a sudden, there's his ex-wife taking pictures in Vietnam. That was interesting. But. Uh, yeah. Well, it was yeah. I, I you know I, I I just remember I was a photojournalist when she finds something that she wants to do again. Yeah, it was sort of yeah. that, and I can't really remember a lot about the book two theme because I wasn't on it very long. Um, I remember I had a whole idea, which I'll tell you another time when we talk. I had an idea for how to end my character because when I wouldn't go on, I agreed to end the character, so she just wouldn't end. You know, um, so we were working on on different ideas. And that was the one they came up with. I remember we shot it up on Mulholland. <laughs> That's, it wasn't really Vietnam. Don't want to burst your bubble, but it wasn't <laughs> Vietnam, of course. <laughs> yeah, I always take this movie seriously, though. I I, uh, I really felt it was. Well, no, I'm just kidding. But um, Oh, and by the way, before I forget, you know, the bunker, I was just remembering when you were saying this. The bunker, I'm pretty sure it was Hallmark back then, but I'm, I think HBO, I think it's now HBO, I think HBO bought it. Oh, did they? Yeah, it's on. Because it's it was a three-hour. It was a three-hour of, of you know with Anthony Hopkins. Oh my God, that has an incredible cast too. So I have to take. A, have, have you seen that one yet or not? Yeah, I, well, I I didn't see it recently, but I saw, I saw it last year. And yeah, they uh, had they had some good people in it. Oh yeah, Richard Jordan and um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, really uh, great. Rich, um, it's interesting you mentioned Richard Jordan because he was a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. And I loved him so much. You know, he passed away. I think he had a brain tumor or something mm-hmm. horrible, some tragedy that happened to him. But he was such an interesting actor. And he was, when I did Savages, my very first movie, at the time he was married to an actress in Kathleen Widows, who was in that. Sam Watterson is in that. Um, so I knew I knew him since then. And at the time we did The Bunker, he was dating Blair Brown. I don't mm-hmm. know if they were, they might have been married. I can't remember. But they were in they were in Paris together so uh we you know our fun times that we had um <laughs> as i say i had more fun than everybody else <laughs> anyway right. you know what you know what you know what else is interesting about that movie that tv show you know who J- julian fellows is uh, the the writer he's a produ- writer producer who's done i think he i think I've, he's done um uh, Dal- downton abbey gosford park um, the tourists. I mean, you know, he's done all kinds of big, big movies. At that point, he was—he had a small role in that, and he was so much fun. We had a good time. I haven't seen him since then, but we had a great time together. Look, if you look up Julian Fellows, 
I don't know how to spell it. I don't know, but I mean, I yeah, think it's probably F-E-L-O. Yeah, yeah, I know who you're talking about, and that's an F-E-L-O. interesting way to spell that last name. I remember that. I, I know the name. I've seen the name. Uh, yeah, this isn't uh, the, the the bunker does have an incredible cast. I mean, gosh, you look at this; it's just Piper Laurie and uh, Piper uh, Laurie. Yes, of course. Oh my God, that was fascinating to work with her. I'd always been a big fan of hers, and I love the way she re- she was very method. When um, when she kills the children, she plays um, Goebbels' wife. Goebbels' wife. What was uh, what was? I'm trying to think of her name. She uh, plays uh, Magda Gold. Magda. Goble. Magna, Magna, that's right. It was Joseph Go- 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 Goebel's wife. Cliff Gorman was Goebel's, I remember. Yeah. And Cliff Gorman, oh, I love Cliff Gorman. Yeah, he's great. Um, but anyway, she um, she was upstairs. They had a fake upstairs, you know how they do. They had a huge set that we shot at this lot, this um, sound, uh, this st- stage, sound stage in in Paris. And you know her part, she has to she has to poison the children. Before the end, I mean, this is when I talk about a bad movie. You yeah. know, he and I bite a bullet, bite a bullet of, of that's uh, poison in it. Anyway, uh, she screamed bloody murder before she did, and it wasn't going to be on camera, but before action, she wanted to get herself into it. I thought that was so smart. I love that she had the nerve to do it because so many actors won't do anything like that. You know? Yeah, they won't go for it. Interesting, yeah. interesting actress. Yeah, she was great. Um, and so, Savages. Uh, this is an. Inter- I, you know, this is on my Netflix. I never. I didn't get this yet. This seems very interesting. And th- so, how was it? Your first role was this uh, experience? Was it a big part? What What, what is your part? It in? wasn't a big part, but I had so much fun. It was, it was pretty. I have to be honest. I think most of the actors would agree, even though it was a an um, an Ivory Merchant film, and Ivory Merchant went on to be very famous. Yeah. James Ivory and Ismail Merchant went on to be very famous for a lot of movies. This was one of their first movies with no with no budget, and they had a, mainly Broadway actors. I mean, I was really out of my league, way out of my league. I had been studying acting, but and there was no real, there was no script. We never had a script. It was sort of what I would call an artsy fartsy movie. I mean, people to this day ask me what it meant, and I don't have a clue. Uh, but it was fun. It was a lot of fun, except for that it was really cold. We we shot it up. We shot it outside of New York City, upstate a little bit, um, and we. And I remember we were we, we were in some old mansion that that they couldn't afford to heat anymore. The people rented it out because it was huge, and uh, and we just we had to be covered in wet mud because we played these mud people, and we were we were half naked. I mean, once again, another naked movie. Uh, I, I remember I remember Sam Watterson was always in front of me with a really cute butt. <laughs> anyway, we, were, we had to smear this wet mud on us every day and all day long, adding more wet mud, which is what I remember the most about it. But in between, the actors were all a lot of fun, so I had a good time. So it was a nude scene and, and, and savage. Well, we're, we're basically nude covered. We're kind of covered in like long oh. hair and stuff like that. But yeah, I think our butts were hanging out or something, you know, <laughs> traipsing around. In New York, up the Hudson, off the Hudson. I wanted to ask you about um, 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 the, the Tower in Inferno. Now, your scene, your last scene, or one of your last scenes, is when you're you're going to safety on the, the, the you know the big the big steel girder, or whatever, and you you go. Yeah, on, what on was that, that called? I forget. I forget yeah. the name of it, but you go on it. Yeah, they, they a- call it something, but uh, you know, fans <laughs> like you who know remind me, but I forget what it's called. Um, they they made a contraption in order for the people to go from one building to the the, the building across. I and it's called that. something. Yes, of course I I do. Yes, it was what fun. What was that like being filmed in that? That's a cool. Well, first of all, that was something that Irwin Allen directed because I say he directed Second Unit. If it wasn't about the acting, if it was more action, right. he directed it. And it was a lot of fun. It was funny because later I talked to somebody. I mean, right now when I say later, I mean like you know the next day. Uh, somebody thought I was so scared to go up in it because we were up above. I wasn't scared at all. First, I was a gymnast. I mean, scary is is, is doing the beam or the the uneven bars. You know, this is not scary. I mean, I'm wrapped into a chair. But to work myself up to be scared yeah. to go between two buildings, supposedly, yeah. um, people were all so worried about me. They thought I was so nervous. I just kept it going because in those days I was very method. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I could have just gotten into it and faked it for all you saw, but that's what I used. So it was fun. I love anything like that. Fun, fun, fun. You know, getting to be an actor. And I love action kind of things. I wish I, I wish I could do more. They may not be movies that I like to see as much, but I love doing them. Yeah. So you haven't seen um, uh, Tower and Inferno in a while, huh? Um, you know, I, I, at one point I was on a treadmill about ten years ago and saw parts of it. 
I have trouble watching because my voice is so high. You know, watching yourself, nobody likes to hear their own voice anyway. And I don't know, my voice was very, very, very high. <laughs> I can't even do it as high as it was. I think I sound like a chipmunk. But so, yeah. No, but it, you, it, didn't, it's, you didn't, though. You didn't. Oh, you're you're, 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 oh, you're too sweet. But it's fun to see things. To if I can get past my own stuff, it's fun to see other performers. You know, to see people that I worked with. And you need to see. I don't know if you can report. The Breaches Boy was. What's that? The report to the commissioner. You got to see that one. I'll send you the DVD. Oh, thank you. Yes. You need to see that yes. one because. Oh, well, I know. I mean, the, the, again, now everyone listening, report to the commissioner. Uh, it's, a, it's a movie that not everyone knows about. In fact, I had just been turned on to it. Um, it's it's really good and and Susan I would say this was one of uh, your most I don't know just a performance it, it as good as you are you're a great actress I, it wasn't that I was surprised but it, I don't know it just had this gritty 70s cop vibe and I just love seeing you in this and uh, you know I thank you because honestly for me my my early work I'm not that thrilled with most of it I think I got it took me a long time to be better I, I'm happy with my work now. I can watch anything I've done in the last, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years. But early on, I couldn't. And and that's the only one that I... And, and, and parts of Rich Man, Poor Man. Mm, because once yeah. again, when I'm playing young, it's a character. You know, uh, I could lose myself in a character. So thank you. I, I really appreciate you saying that. And you and, thank and you. Rich Man, Poor Man, not only, you know, do I think you were good, but you won a Golden Globe for this, right? You, you, this is yes, I did. Thank you. Yes, I did. I get. Uh, yes, I was nominated for an Emmy won a Golden Globe, and I've tried to so a stupid for, question, but i got to ask yeah. because I'm just a, what's it like when you're saying, you, you were there, obviously? And no, I didn't go. Oh, you didn't it's, go? No, it's a terrible you sent story. sent Indian up to accept it for you, like Marlon Brando? I'm kidding. No, I sent my friend, uh, my friend Andrea Marcovici, who I also insisted that she be hired in the Concord. Concord wonderful okay. actress, a wonderful singer. If you're, if you're in any city, she performs around the country a lot, cabaret. She performs in New York City, of course, here in, in L.A. and San Francisco. Yeah. Andrea, I had Andrea go because, you know why? I had a free trip to Tahiti. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. And, you know, when I was acting, we had free trips all over. I mean, I was modeling. We had free trips all over, but you were always working. So I wasn't used to, like, being offered free trips for, didn't have to work. You would just hang out. I'd never been to Tahiti. So, and I was never really into the sort of what I would call the trappings of of being a star. I would have been perfectly happy never to have any of them. And I kind of thought that, that awards were silly, and I didn't really get that they were about your business, you know. And yeah. I just, not, not having, you know, I came to L.A. sort of late and was only here for, I just didn't know anything. And. It was another stupid decision I made, but I was not there. I was there. Let's see. I, I'm trying to. I presented so an. I presented an Oscar. About? When did I hear about that? Yeah. Um, I, mean, were, were you I think we got a telegram. I think oh. we got a telegram when I was in Tahiti. But I mean, I did go. I did go when I presented an Oscar. I did present an um, a Golden Globe. I was nominated for a different Golden Globe that I did go. So oh. I learned later, and I did go. When I, which I did not win that Golden Globe, and I did not win an Emmy that I that I was nominated for. So I did go later, but this was my first, and I just didn't know. Sorry to say, that's shame quite a to say. Though. That's a, that's a quite a telegram to get. That's yes, it was nice. I didn't I didn't realize what a big deal it was to be honest. I just didn't get it. Well, <laughs> Otherwise, know. I wouldn't have been in Tahiti to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> well, it lets people know how how good uh, your character was. And now I got to bring up an actor that. Uh, that I really love in this, uh, William Smith. Thank you. I love him, too. I mean, can you get badder than, well, I mean, that guy was so great. And Falcon Eddie was yeah. great. And you had, a, you had one scene or two scenes with him. You know, it's funny is that when anybody who knows him, and I'm sure you've met him over the years, uh-huh. he's like the nicest guy ever. Yeah. Ever, 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 a wonderful guy. I haven't seen him in years, and I would love to see him. He's such a—he was so nice and such a good actor, and so lovely to work with. I mean, really, a serious actor. And I think he yeah. started doing—I think he started off being a stuntman, as I recall. Well, I mean, yeah, you guys knew him as an actor, but I think—I think Rich Man Poor Man was one of his first big roles, and he was already so good. And and you know, he portrayed—you really believe that he was—he was a scary dude. Oh. Yeah. He takes care of. He's like uh, the Grim Reaper. He takes care of everyone. He, they, they didn't have to end the show. They just had William Smith kill everybody. I mean, he, <laughs> and didn't. But he was. He was in book two, right? Yeah, Wasn't he in book it, two? In book two is when he becomes. He's one of the main characters, and he is. It's great because he's bad, but he's also like kind of cowardly. And oh, it, 
I'll have amazing. to watch it. You know, I did. I didn't watch book two. I didn't. I didn't go on watching it. And it was so silly of me. Um, but I, I should see it because if if I'd realized he was in it, I would have. Um, because I, I found that out later that he was. He had a big role in it. He was so nice. And what I liked about David Green, by the way, the director who who I thought did the better parts of them, uh, and, and, and Boris Segal was excellent too, but I think David Green was quite brilliant in the first four hours, his directing, as I say, on, on a very small budget, the same as any TV show, nothing like, let's say you do in, oh, any so show today. Small, it was a small budget for that, for, for Rich Man Poor Man? Oh, I'm saying Rich Man Poor Man had the exact same budget that any hourly episode of Universal oh, got wow. in those days. So it isn't well, like it when you're shooting. Like it. It yeah, I mean, when you're shooting something today, that's a that's a mini series on HBO or whatever. Any of them, they have huge budgets. You know, right. bigger than a lot of films. Um, but anyway, when it came to the scene where, where when I I think Falconetti was trying to rape me and Nick Nolte's character Tom Jordash saves me. Yeah. Um, I said to David Green, I just hate when the women, the way it was written, and the women were always in those days. Just they they would jump away as they were being saved, and they would you know scream and yell and oh and oh oh no you know that kind of thing. I said let me let me try and jump him. <laughs> I said because that's what I would do in life. I mean most oh. women would yeah. because Nick is Nick is being he's he's I I think that's actually when he kills Nick Nolte and I mean Tom Jordash's or, character. You know, well he gets mad and then it happens later but yeah. Oh that's right that's that's because Nick, Nick so of course I was wondering how I got out of there if if he did that that's right Nick Nolte beats him up or something and gets me out of there. And so he comes back to kill him on the boat, right, on and the dock, mad right? At you for the rest of the, the Listen, I was mad at me. I could barely watch it. I was, I felt so guilty, and I watched it at the big screening with everybody there. I felt the hatred of towards my character. Well, you know, <laughs> That's why she yeah. wouldn't, she wouldn't have been a lot of fun in book two. She had to go into a deep, a bit deeper depression. She was already an alcoholic in a bad you depression. Your, you found your calling. You just, you, you picked the wrong place to be a photographer. I mean, you know, if you went to, you know. San Francisco, but you had to go to Vietnam, so that was a bad choice. Yeah, no, I had I I asked to be killed off. <laughs> At least they did it nicely. <laughs> now let me just say this. Now this rich man, poor man. Sometimes, like like you were mentioning in the first two hours, it did feel like kind of a mini movie. But then there's a point because it goes on a long time where it does sort of feel like a kind of a TV series. Um, more than a mini series because it goes on. Oh well, long, when, well when it the first one was a mini series. Yeah. The first one was a mini series. It's complete as a mini series, yeah. and I felt it should in there, honestly. But the but the audience, the American audience, was into it, and that's why they went on. Even I mean, I, I felt that. you know, I mean, you know that the book ended. The book yeah. that that it was taken after ended at the end of, of book one, and right. so they just they just they just created things to go on because it was so it was such a hit. So and then that became sort of because it seemed that's a lot longer book two. So that seems like it's like not only a mini series, but it seemed like like it was a series. I mean, gosh, it goes on forever. And uh, I know I was so stupid to but do there's it. There's no poor man. There's only rich man, rich rich man, and uh, I know there's no. I know I never thought of that. Well, well I guess they use the son. You know, you know, I'm friends now with Greg Henry. Oh, he, he was played, great. He played Nick's son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. Really and great. I and uh, and and then. Richard, who was who, who played my son? Um, oh, um, he was at the autograph show. I'm trying to think of what his name. Um, oh well, gosh. yeah, Lee McCluskey played. Lee McCluskey, your, yes. Your son, but then he grew up into another character. And I'll find him real soon. Oh, that's right. That's why I'm thinking too. Yes, Richard or somebody. Something. That's yeah. right. But uh, but Greg Henry is a wonderful wonderful singer, by the way. He's a you great know, he was actor, in Hung. Oh, wonderful actor. He was in Hung, which was one of my favorite shows. Uh, I don't know if it's still on. I, mean, I don't know. They take these long hiatuses. You can't tell. It might still be coming back. But he's yeah, he's great in Hung, and uh, and I go to I go to watch him perform. He's fantastic. He's yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's uh, James Carroll Jordan plays. That's uh, who it was. Yeah, James played, Carroll Jordan. So Lee turns into James Carroll Jordan, and yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, rich man, poor man, uh, it, it is something for everyone. And everything you're in is on DVD, so everyone needs to see. see. They need to have a uh, a uh, Susan Blakely. Uh, what is it? I've had sort of a, a marathon. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I don't know. If I have enough good work for that. I have some better better TV yes, movies yeah. than some of them, but you know, but well, I, I'm so glad you enjoyed them. Thank stuff you. Stuff like The Towering Inferno is one of the greatest. Disaster films ever made. It really is, and it's not just. Well, you're right. Yeah. So it really, and you know, Concord is. It's a fun movie um, because not only you know I, I got to be honest. 
the, the airport movies that, that were that were taken more seriously, like the ones like with Charlton Heston and everything, um, they everything was just really took place inside the plane. But this one, you have you have a good twenty minutes where you're running around with these like documents, and then well, that's the right, airplane, documents, that's and then right, it was more the running around in Paris, and then. So there's a lot of stuff going on. So it's, it's well, listen, I was thrilled to run around in Paris. We got to shoot in Paris and D.C. So any time I had those kind of shoots, I was thrilled. <laughs> so I'm so glad. I'm so glad you enjoyed them. Yeah, it's good stuff. So um, and, and uh, you know, your husband wrote a book. We could talk about that real quick if you want. The oh, thank you. My husband. Well, he didn't really write it. He wrote it with two other people. He wrote three well. people. Okay put together this book it's sort of compiled and edited and written by it's it's um it, for basketball fans it's about the original dream team it's called the original dream team portrait of the game okay. and um and it's got it's just for the people who are into basketball are just loving it so thank you yeah you can get that i think on i guess on amazon you can get it on amazon also there if you want to read it the original dream team dot com and uh yeah, especially now. I mean, you know, we just won that basketball. That was a close game, huh? That Olympic game. Yeah, yeah. And but I mean, this team. I mean, all the teams are great, but that team no, was this so one's amazing. Team. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. It was the one that people talk about forever, and and and, uh, it, and it has everything that everybody talked about. It all the players talking about their experiences and all the little stories and everything like that. You're right. I think if you go to the internet, it's under the original dream team dot com, right? Yeah, there's that, and then yeah, well, Amazon is the best place to go because, uh, and and all these movies, Netflix, uh, Rich Man, Poor Man, or uh, uh, Towering in Front, all this stuff, a lot of the stuff you've done uh, is out there. I think Reports of the Commissioner just came out not too long ago. Uh, Capone has a beautiful DVD package, uh, so you know, got to. Well, I hope that. everybody enjoys it. It was fun talking to you, James. Well, thank you. So much. I, I I appreciate this so much. And uh, what kind it's of a long thing? interview? I hope it wasn't too long. No, we went never on, too didn't long. we? People love it. People love it because it's a it's conversation, and, and and you're never boring. You're always interesting. And uh, oh, so. thank you. Maybe you can divide <laughs> it into ten interviews. <laughs> yeah, it could be like rich man, poor man. I'll, uh, it, it'll be uh, rich man, poor man. We'll, we'll we'll put it in different parts, different episodes. So. Okay, you know, I like it. Long. It's not too my 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 interview two days ago with an actor named Antonio Fargus was this length and and it it's it I get a lot of hits so this is great these these interviews are conversations that's how I, long it takes to tell the story it just I takes love, that I long love talking to you guys because I tell you I'll say this all, all of you actors actresses you guys uh, are just uh, you you make life better I it's from a film fanatic like myself I watch this stuff and it's 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 great and, and all of course the you know what. Actors, we, we seriously, we are just so lucky that there are people like you. That we have fans and people that are that are true uh, cinema phobes, you know, that get out there and watch the things. We're all so lucky. All of us, absolutely everybody in the industry, is so lucky about that. I'm going to tell you a little inside story here at the very end. Guess what? The game that I play poker with. I think I told you I was going to be playing poker last oh, night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Kevin Dobson was there and um, Tony um, Dennison and um, oh my God, my Michael Lerner. Um, Hal Linden. Oh, Joe Bologna. Joe Bologna. That's what I was going to tell you. The reason I was saying saving Hal Linden to the last, though, get this: Hal Linden got a royal flush. <laughs> it never happened. I mean, most of these people they play all the time. Some of them have been playing thirty wow. years and never seen one. Some people they do a picture the night that they do this. This a game that some guy, uh, this this one man, uh, Walt, uh, Norby Walters, puts on, and then every single time anybody gets a. Uh, 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 a straight flush, which I got one of, but a lot like Hal Linden said, he's never been there in all those years. He's never been in a picture when anybody at the table got a straight flush, and he gets a royal flush wow. right in the beginning, just a few hands in. It was just unbelievable. That's Boy, cool. that was exciting. So I, and I, you know, I actually read that on Twitter. You tweeted it. it was so cool. I like, tweeted it yes during everyone, the game. I try and stay off the phone. But but everyone's got to go to your your Twitter page. It's fun. Twitter is better, I think, for actors and actresses, right? Because you guys could really just just get it right out there. It's, it's, I, I'm enjoying it. I'm also I'm also putting in thanks to people like you who are giving me films. Also, Susan Blakely on Facebook. But you have to make sure it's me, Susan Blakely. There's a picture of me, so if you know what I look like, it's yeah, me. Susan Blakely, and it'll say. Yeah, and it comes up. I'll just tell people now. It comes up. Susan Blakely 
actor right actress um oh right actor director or something i act, i don't well, they yeah, have that they have well they have actor slash director and i was wondering like anybody who's an actor comes up as actor slash director am i right they do automatically there's nothing yes. weird but but yeah there you I'm, go and it's got a great picture a, a current picture and there's a Great picture in the. What's that from the the big picture you got there? That's really pretty. I think it's a modeling picture. Yeah. Is it? Does it have a little scarf on it? Yes, you have. I'm scarf. Do, does it? Do I have a scarf on? <laughs> right, it's a modeling picture. <laughs> so I don't, that's what people have to look for. You have like a scarf, and it's very exotic. And then there's a a recent picture, and uh, and it's the it says the official fan page. So we get the yes, go like it. There. Yes, you have to go like it. You gotta like my Facebook and and follow me on Twitter. That would be great. Thanks. Give me your Twitter again. Uh, that's Susan underscore Blakely. Underscore. B L A and this Blakely is B L A K E like Blake B L A K E L Y. Okay. In case anyone's taking notes. All right. Well, this was uh, this was great. I thank you so much. Uh, I hate ending these. I wanted to talk forever because you're, you're. Well, I'm always here. I'll be here. I'll always be here if you think of other questions. Well, one of these you can days, do an addendum. One of these days, you know, I've done two parters. I've done three parters. One of these days, I'm going to see the fan, Francis Fisher. I'm going to see all these things, and we'll have a part two, and and I'll, and I'll set it up to where we'll get some people you've worked with on at the same time. We'll have a little round. Oh, table. that would be fun. Yeah, we'll get Perry and I. We can talk about. We can get Perry and I and the director from uh, Lords of Flatbush. I don't know if you can get Henry. There may be too many of us. But I know I can put Perry and, and Marty together if you'd like to well, do it. Do, I would love that. Uh, um, this is uh, this is great. So um, we'll talk again. Thank you so much. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, James. Okay. Have a good evening. All right. Thanks. Bye. Right, bye. All right, James Tate, and uh, this is the uh, Cinema Podcast Show. Let me give um, some plugs out here once again. Susan's husband compiled helped helped compile a book, The Original Dream Team, uh, the original dream team dot com and Amazon, um, and you could check that out. Now my website is, and I want everyone to go here because I write. I, I, unlike a lot of blogs, I guess I guess it's a blog more than a website, but I have um, I have a, a post a day. I have a, either a movie review or a, an interview, or I put movie reviews like. Um, Tomorrow's interview uh, movie review is going to be for Concord, and I'm going to have this interview linked up to it, Susan, with Susan, and and I, I mix all that stuff. So it's cultfilmfreaks.com. That's cultfilmfreaks.com, and uh, and like me on on um, Facebook, Cult Film Freak Radio. Um, and uh, another plug here, real quick, uh, a friend of mine on iOffer could get a lot of cool movies that uh, you might not have seen in a while because they're not on um, DVD. Great stuff for UAZ is his store. So it's iOffer.com forward slash users forward slash great stuff for UAZ. And uh, I, this is uh, James Tate, Blog Talk Radio, Cinema Podcast, and uh, and, and that's it. I just thank, thank Susan once again, and uh, and I just hope to keep keep this up it's a lot of fun take care blog talk radio where millions of hosts and listeners gather 